consider it to be a privilege to be in a situation where I have to preach all the time because that keeps me um, in the word and I do consider communicating the word to be a great privilege. So I'm glad to have the opportunity today. I just want to affirm you young people spending uh, these hours investing in your future um, through Bible study. God bless you for that. Brother David, thank you for the message. I was very blessed by numerous points, and I affirm that the truth of realizing that I can reckon myself dead because of what Christ did on the cross for me is powerful in the battle that we all face against the flesh. Reckon yourselves to be dead. So thank you for that sharing. Um, I'd like to ramble a little bit this morning, if I can, before getting directly into our um, profile of kingdom courage for today. I'm not just uh, rambling um, with no purpose, but a couple of you came to me yesterday and said, Daniel, you said that we should ask God for spiritual sight. And what are some steps that we could take to cultivate spiritual sight? Um, we were talking about Elisha and the servant and how Elisha's servant saw only the army, whereas Elisha saw that there was an army around that army and saw themselves not penned in by the Syrian army, but rather on center stage to see God work out his glory. How do we cultivate that kind of spiritual sight? And so I just want to mention um, a couple of things to you along that line. Um, the beginning of the book of Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that we, as believers, we, as people who believe that God created the earth, we believe that the worlds were formed by the word of God. And that's just a very basic statement. You go back to the beginning of the Bible, go to the book of Genesis. We believe that God spoke and this world was created. And so Hebrews 11 states it in just a slightly different way, but don't misunderstand the words. We as believers hold to the fact that the worlds were framed or formed out of the word of God. Are you with me? Then the next verse says, we can draw from this that that means that the things which we see and can touch and handle, the physical world was not made out of things which do appear because the word of God is something spiritually visible but not physically visible. I mean the word coming from the mouth of God, obviously written down on the pages of scripture, we can see it, but the word of God is an invisible force. And we believe that the things which we see were not made out of other things that we can see. This world is not just um, unique atoms and molecules that God arranged into the visible forms that we see. We believe that underneath all of those molecules and atoms and everything that science tells us about this world, we believe that it was actually formed by the word of God which means that we go deeper than what the rest of the physical world go, d does. When they look at this world, they say, well, let's see what it's made out of. It's made out of these neutrons and electrons and protons and all those things. We go a step further and say, actually, at the very, very basis, it was formed by the word of God. So if we hold that God created this world through his spoken word, then we hold that the spoken word of God is more powerful and is in front of this physical world that we, that we see every day. How do I cultivate spiritual eyesight? Well, a starting point is just to acknowledge that the word of God is more real, was here first, and is what this physical world was created out of. Am I making any sense there? 
So it, this world is created from the Word of God. If this world is created out of the Word of God, then when the Word of God speaks something into my life, which doesn't seem to make sense when I look at the world around me, I, as a believer in the creative power of the Word of God, choose to hold on to what the Word of God tells me about that situation rather than what my eyes tell me about that situation. Does that make sense? So that's a step in cultivating a spiritual eyesight. I simply give honor and I give honor and respect to the word of God as being superior to the physical world since this physical world was created by the word of God. So that's one one point which I think we can um, pursue in cultivating spiritual eyesight. Secondly, And I'm not saying that this is definitive in any way. These are just two burdens that came to my heart in response to your question. How do I cultivate spiritual sight? Be careful of where you rest your head. And this quote is not original with me. The heart that I'm taking out of it might be, but the quote is not. Beware of where you rest your head. Jacob rested his head on a stone and had visions of heaven. Samson rested his head in the lap of Delilah and lost his sight. The quote's not original with me, but it speaks deeply to my heart, and it speaks deeply to your heart as young people. Where do we rest our heads? And by rest our heads, I'm not really meaning whether you go to sleep on a Walmart pillow or one of these wonderful goose down pillows that the Hutterites have. I sleep on one. I have friends who are Hutterites. It doesn't really, I'm not talking about the kind of pillow you like to sleep on. What do you amuse yourself with? What do you relax yourself with? Where do you go to relax? Jacob rested with his head on a stone and had visions of heaven and the angels descending and ascending up and down that ladder. Samson, from many, many angles, a much more mighty man, chose to spend his amusement time on the lap of different women. And in the lap of Delilah, he lost his sight. I don't think we use this word anymore, but when I was a boy, we used to say, yikes. What a tragedy. Just what a picture. What a picture of this massive, strong man. I think his power was supernatural. I also think if you would have seen him, he was a big man. This giant of a man with a giant calling and miraculous powers laying with his head in the lap of a woman. And so clueless to what was going on around him that she was able to literally spin a web of deception around that man that resulted in him losing his eyesight. Where are you and I going for our amusement? Y'all have a challenge that no generation has ever had. And I acknowledge that. This is a challenge that no generation has ever faced like your generation has to face it. Not even close to it. I have serious conversations with myself. I'm glad that David gives me backing that that's biblical. I talk to myself. But I seriously ask myself whether I could have lived the life I lived as a 15 to 18 year old had I had this availability in my life. I really wonder, because I know the kind of temptations I faced and I didn't have this. So if you want to cultivate spiritual eyesight, where you rest your head, where you go for amusement, where you go for relaxation is really important. It could be a place that you rest your head and it gives you eyesight, spiritual eyesight. You see visions of heaven. Or it could be a place where you lose your physical eyesight like Samson did. Amen.
I said I'm rambling a little bit. That's just an answer to the question that was asked yesterday. Two points that will help you to cultivate spiritual eyesight. I want to start with two stories this morning that are related to what I'm sharing, but not directly. Um, I come from Africa, and I think it's good for me to lace in just a, a few little stories of, of life there and things that might help you to understand who I am and a little bit about the work of God um, over there. I am a kind of excitable person. You might have seen that yesterday, and if you did, you saw me under great control. I'm very much not wanting to offend you by getting excited. And remember yesterday I had to stand in front of that one mic, which today I can move around a little bit. I'm probably wired to be an excited, excitable, emotional person. But beyond that, I'm excited because I have really gotten to witness the power of the gospel in real life. And because of that, I'm not ashamed of it. And I would love to be able to help you young people be a little bit less ashamed and a little bit more confident and a little bit more excited about the gospel that you choose to hold to. You are here with almost every one of you here identifying as a Christian. That is your identity. You are a believer. You are a believer in the gospel. You, you are a part of a church. You're a part of a Christian family. But it is possible to be part of the Christian family, to be a member of God's family, but because of maybe a lack of understanding of the power of the gospel, maybe because we haven't proven it in our own lives as much as we might like, maybe we're not yet living in victory as we would wish to, maybe we haven't uh, been exposed to the way that the gospel works in other places, it's possible that you can have the power of the gospel working in your life, but still be carrying some element of shame that you're a Christian. Almost like you need to apologize for it. Whereas Paul says to us in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And then he gives us the reason why he wasn't ashamed. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God changing people's lives. And that's why I'm not ashamed of it. You know, when, when somebody is selling something, some kind of a multi-level marketing thing, and they're telling you about this wonderful product, but it's not really something that changed their own life, that's a different kind of marketing. But if I could tell you that I used to be 350 pounds, and I was working really hard, and I was exercising, and I couldn't drop the weight, and then I found something, what was this one 10 years ago? Plexus? I don't know if that's even a thing anymore. Is that still a thing? I remember hearing about it. If I could tell you that somebody introduced me to Plexus or Malaluka or whatever all these other things are, and I started taking this and the pounds dropped away and now you look at me as a picture of middle-aged health and it's down to Plexus. You know, I might not want to be a multi-level marketing guy. I don't. I don't. Okay? I don't. However, if there was a tablet that taking four tablets a day could drop me from 350 pounds to the man that I am here, I would not be ashamed of it. I would just tell people honestly, what's your secret? It's Lexus. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God. It changes people's lives. And so I want you to understand that not only have I seen the power of the gospel work in my own life, but I've seen it work in other cultures, in other settings. And it's led me to be an excited believer in the gospel. Amen? I don't want to know what my life would be without Christ. I don't want to know. But it would not be beautiful. A few years ago, I was in Tamale in northern Ghana, and uh, Tamale is a center for a lot of um, non-governmental organizations. People come in to do development work. And I was having lunch, and there was a Dutchman, a man from Holland, sitting um, over at a table nearby, and I started chatting with him, and, and I was looking for an opportunity to inquire about his soul. 
And so we just started chatting a little bit, and he said, well, you're an American. And I said, yeah, and he said, he's from Holland, and I know a little bit about Holland, and so I started to try to introduce the gospel into our conversation. They had just had elections in Holland, and I asked him about the political parties, and <clears throat> I was looking for an opportunity to somehow find out about his soul. And finally he told me, he said, I'm not a Christian. He said, my parents used to go to the Catholic Church, but I'm an atheist. I believe in being good, but I don't believe there's a God. It's just this life is all we have. So he, he mentioned that. We went on a little bit further, and he finally told me, he said, well, um, I, I hate your president. Wow. That was during the uh, presidency of George W. Bush. He said, I hate your president but I love your country. And I said, how do you hate my president and you love my country? He said, well, my grandfather was a prisoner of war in a German camp, a, a German prisoner of war during World War II, and the camp um, was liberated by the American military. And he said, because of that debt of gratitude, I will forever love your country, even if I hate some of its political leaders. And I saw my opening. And I said, well, sir, I said, that's exactly how I relate to the gospel. That's how I relate to the word of God. I said, you see, my father was a drug addict and an alcoholic who hated children. That was before he met Christ. And after my father met Christ, his life was transformed. He left drugs and alcohol. He became passionately in love with the word of God and spent his life loving his children, raising a family, and loving the word of God until the day he died, although at that point he was still alive. I said, so even if God had never done anything for me, I would absolutely owe a debt of gratitude to the power of what God's word did in my father's life. Even if I didn't want to believe it for myself, I would have to say, wow, my life as a little boy born to a man who was a drug addict, an alcoholic, and hated children. My personal life was massively improved because my father met Christ. Are you with me? So that's the power of the gospel. Even if God didn't do anything for me, I have to be grateful for what it did for my father and then indirectly, of course, made, made my upbringing very different. I'm not ashamed of the power of the gospel. It changes people's lives. And he said, I never thought of it that way. Wow, that's interesting. More recently, just a couple of weeks ago, um, Rudy was with us in Ghana, and Rudy had the opportunity to give blood to a young lady who was in need of a blood transfusion. Rudy and one of my, as I call them, my chocolate family. I have a large African family that calls me Papa and we refer to them as the chocolate family. One of my chocolate sons and Rudy went and gave blood. Let me tell you a little bit of the story that went behind that. <clears throat> this is a young lady who got sick with typhoid. I don't really believe we have typhoid in the Western world anymore, but it's a type of salmonella poisoning which um, latches onto the intestines, and if it's left untreated, eventually perforates, think, bursts, the intestines, and that person will, will die rapidly if they don't have surgery. And so the, the story of this young lady is that she was working in another town, learning to be a seamstress. As I said yesterday, she was apprenticing to a tailor madame, and she got sick. And a couple of the girls who were working together in that little tailor shop got sick at the same time, and um, they sent this young lady back to her parents sick with typhoid. She happens to have an uncle who's a deacon in our church out in the villages. And when this young lady came home to the family, they said, we think the madame cursed these children because how is it possible that three girls all got sick at the same time? So the parents are sending threatening messages back to the madame and saying, you better undo the curse that you did on our daughters because if one of our daughters dies, we are coming for you. Three girls got sick in the same week. We think you did this. Three girls ate the same typhoid-infested food and got sick in the same week. But that's not the worldview of those who don't know science and the Word of God. But this young lady happened to have an uncle named Moses who's a deacon in our church. And Moses took this young lady to the local clinic. The local clinic said, we think you have a stomach ulcer. 
They treated her for a stomach ulcer for two days. She wasn't getting better. Moses decided of his own accord to take her to the hospital a few, about 20 miles away from their village, took her to the hospital. She was there for a couple of days, and the same thing. They were treating her for a stomach ulcer. They were not x-raying her. They were not scanning her to find out what was really going on. Meanwhile, she was getting sicker by the day. The family of the daughter said, just bring her home. You know, she's cursed. If that madame doesn't release the curse, she's going to die. It doesn't matter what we do. Moses said, no, we are going to take her out to the hospital in the city of Tomale, which is where we live. And Moses took this young lady and put her in a car and brought her all the way to Tomale. And as soon as they got to Tomale, the doctors in Tomale are better equipped. They did a scan. They said, her intestine has already perforated. She's going into toxic shock. And they operated And then Deacon Moses contacted me and said, we have to do an operation. We need two people to come donate blood. And Rudy and uh, one of my sons named Kwasi donated their blood. And the day before you left Ghana, or two days before, she came back through Tomali for her checkup. And he got to see her. And she's well. And she's healed. And Moses told the story to me of all of the, the back and forths between him and the family. You have an unbelieving family who believes that this girl has been cursed and she's going to die no matter what you do. And you have a deacon who believes that through prayer and, of course, the, the doctors and the power of medicine, this girl is not cursed. And Moses kept telling them, if you all go and do witchcraft on this young lady, I will withdraw my hands from the case. If you're going to do witchcraft, I'm not going to take her to the hospital. And finally, they said, well, she's dead anyway. You can take her to the hospital. And now she's well, and she's healed. I am not ashamed of the power of the gospel. Thank God that 12 years ago, the gospel reached the village of Deacon Moses, and he came to Christ, and his worldview has been changed, and he no longer is subject to those curses, and he views the world from a different perspective because he's not under the curse of those... those the, the, he's not under the, the power, the tension of those curses. That young lady would not have lived. When your intestines perforate, you go into toxic shock. You have hours... But because of Deacon Moses and his viewpoint, and yes, the young men who donated blood, well, all of that is Christ. I'm telling you one story. I witness this on an almost daily basis in the villages where we preach the gospel starting 20 couple of years ago. I witness these kind of stories every single day where the gospel has come in and absolutely revolutionized the situation. I am not ashamed of the power of the gospel. Oh, what are you doing there in Africa? Doing development work? Actually, I'm preaching the gospel. You're like trying to change their religion? I had somebody sit beside me on the plane. A lady said that. You're not trying to change their religion, are you? Aren't they happy the way they are? No, ma'am, they're not. They're lost. I'm not ashamed. No, I'm, I'm preaching the gospel. I truly, firmly believe there's nothing that equals the effect that the gospel has on society. So I want to encourage you young people, what you have as a believer, what you have as a member of the family of Christ is something that you should not be ashamed of. You should be proud of it. And I do not mean proud in a way that lifts up your face, but proud in a way that stands and says, Lord Jesus, I believe that your gospel is the greatest life-changing force. I thank you for making it available for, to me, and I pray that you'll use me to make it available to others. That kind of pride. Amen. Amen. Let's turn to the book of 1 Samuel and chapter 17. Our profile in Kingdom Courage today is in the life of David. We are in 1 Samuel and chapter 17. I trust that these narrative story-based messages will be memorable to you Um, as a communicator of God's word. I know that I'm not communicating anything new to you. There's nobody here who doesn't know the story of David and Goliath, and I realize that. 
I'm hoping that God shines a light on some new areas of this story in your life so that you take away some new insight and some encouragement from a familiar old story. I believe that we are privileged to have all grown up with the stories of the Bible, you know, in our, in our, in our cribs. I, I heard my first Bible stories while I was still in the crib. My father started having family devotions early in the morning before he would go to work, and I was in the crib. I have pictures to prove it. I was still in bed. I think it's a wonderful thing that we grew up with these Bible stories. The only possible negative is that these stories sometimes remain as something we tell to our children. Does that make sense? It's like, yeah, that's, I know what that is. That's the story of David and Goliath. That's the story of Noah and the animals. Yeah, that's the story of Mount Carmel. And we relegate some of these Old Testament stories to being something for our children when they have a lot of pertinence to our adult life. So if possible today, I'd like to take that story from your childhood, familiar to you, and bring it into our adult lives and, and hopefully light it on fire with the help of God so that it, it will shine a light on our lives. 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to read the first 15 verses rapidly. If you will, the first 15 verses of 1 Samuel 17 are like the introduction of the the individuals onto the stage for the play that we are about to witness. These first verses introduce the main players. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah and Ephesdamon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them. And there went out... A champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, and he had an helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. That's who David was. He was the son of that Ephrathite, just the son of that Ephrathite, you know. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And we'll stop there. Previous to this, David has been introduced into the, the, the um, royal palace. He's the young man who plays the harp for Saul. But it says here that he had returned back from Saul, possibly because his three brothers needed to serve in the army. And so his services were needed back taking care of the sheep. He had returned from Saul and gone back to take care of the sheep. It was not entirely um, uncommon for armies in those days to face off sort of at a deadlock across the no man's land and someone could propose, how about if we settle this rather than thousands on each side dying, what if we settle this through a duel? And if both sides would agree that they would support the... the um, the way that the duel ended and they would acknowledge the winner of the duel and acknowledge that army as the winner, then it, a lot of bloodshed could be saved. And so what Goliath was doing was not entirely uncommon. It's just that Goliath was so much more imposing than your average um, person who would call for a duel. I want to highlight here in this first um, setting that 
Goliath identifies the armies of Israel as the servants of Saul. Just remember that. That's pretty important. He says, I am the Philistine, and you all are here as the servants of Saul. Saul was the first king that Israel had ever had. This was the first time that you could have possibly said the armies of Israel are the servants of a man. But Goliath says, you all are here as the servants of Saul. Just choose a man and let him come out and fight. So now we are in verse 16, and we read, And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself for 40 days. Can you imagine the effect that that had on the frame of mind, the psychological war that's going on here? 40 days and nights this man comes out and and just wears down the hearts of the Israeli army. Verse 17, And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Now Saul and they that all and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the army in array, the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of a keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his Brethren. There's actually a lot of details in this story. I wish we could go through all of them. But here he is. He arrives. He arrives right at that point in the morning where Goliath is coming out. And he gets to witness this in the first hand. And as he talked with them, his brothers, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words. The next four words are our first point. And David heard them. And David heard them. Our first point is that David heard differently. David heard differently. Thousands, maybe tens of thousands, possibly a hundred thousand Israelite men, but let's just do tens of thousands. Tens of thousands of Israelite men have heard this charade 40 times in the morning and 40 times at night. They've listened to this almost a hundred times. But the story is about to change because of these Four words. David runs in, leaves the carriage with the keeper, runs in. The battle cry is going up and the Israeli armies are coming forward. It's probably a show that they would put on every morning. And while he's there greeting his brothers, there comes Goliath of Gath. And he repeats, the Bible doesn't even repeat what he says. It just says he says the same thing he's been saying. But something is different this time round. David heard them. Oh, I'd like you all to be different. David heard differently. And David heard them. Saul had heard them. Eliab, Shammah, his brothers, the captains, all the military men, the strong ones, the old ones, the young ones, they'd all heard it. Day after day eroding their confidence, eroding their valor, eroding their courage, eroding their faith. But this time, David heard them. Wow! I'd love for a generation of Christian young people to stand up who would be able to see and hear things that others have seen and heard. Maybe even their parents have seen and heard. Christendom has seen and heard, but they hear it and it's so, such a milepost that it gets noted in Scripture, and David heard it. Why, why on earth would Scripture note that? Of course David heard it, right? Of course he heard it. He's standing with his brothers. But the Scriptures note, and David heard it. David heard differently. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, 
fled from him and were sore afraid. So sort of the picture I get here is that every morning, I don't know for sure, but every morning these two armies would come down from their hilltops and kind of make a rush at each other and probably banging drums and blowing horns and trumpets and they would all march toward each other shouting their battle cries and then in the midst of that, Goliath of Gath would stand up and start insulting the armies of Israel. And that would be the end of the military display. That would be the end of, here we are. When the men of Israel heard it, they fled. When the men of Israel saw him, they fled and were sore afraid. How many times has this happened? (laughs) Here he comes out again, and here we are running again. My, you want to talk about ruining the morale of your army. Let's do this every day. Every day we go out here. Here we are. Here we are. We're the armies of Israel. And every day that man stands up and starts his nonsense. And as soon as he starts talking, all the men of Israel are sore afraid. And they start running away. And you just keep repeating this day after day. David heard differently. Not only David heard differently, he saw differently. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him and the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and will make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? Could I please see a parade of King Saul's daughters? Did you say one of the the king's daughters is on offer? Which of his daughters is it? He he heard differently, he saw differently, and he spoke differently. David doesn't say, could I please see what I'm fighting here for? If I'm going to go out there and be the knight in shining armor, I'd sure like to see what the damsel in distress looks like. Which of the king's daughters did you say? David spake to the men that stood by him and said, What shall be done to the man that kills this Philistine? and takes away the reproach from Israel. David's not thinking about himself. David didn't say, did you say I'm going to be tax-free? That would really help my investment strategy. Did you say I get to marry one of the king's daughters? That would sure be a bump up in life. He says, what's going to be done to the man who takes away this reproach from Israel? For, a little of his logic, for who? Is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Nothing in David's words about who is this man who's talking against the servants of Saul? He says, who is this man that he's defying the armies of the living God? David saw differently and he spoke differently. All the men of Israel saw that man and took off and ran day after day. What an embarrassment. Can you imagine all these men running day after day away from this giant? Every day, the chance of of an Israelite man stepping up and saying, okay, I'm done with this. Let me take this guy on. The chance of that went down every single day because when a whole bunch of men are running in fear, it's not an environment in which somebody normally stands up, except that David heard it. And David immediately realized this is really not a battle of size. This is really not about how how gigantic Goliath of Gath is and how large the largest Israelite man is. We don't know for sure who the largest Israelite man was, but who's one of the largest Israelite men? King Saul. The Bible says he was head and shoulders above everyone else. So if you're head and shoulders above everyone else, Saul was already a big man. And the people answered him, verse 27, and the people answered him after this manner, saying, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. Verse 28, and Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? 
And with whom hast thou left those few sheep? David. Where did you leave those few sheep? Don't think that you're like a mighty man in any way, David. You're not even a mighty shepherd, okay? Where did you leave those few sheep? In the wilderness. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thy heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Every David has an Eliab. Every David has an Eliab. It might not be your own blood brother. But any time a David stands up and says, God is going to intervene in this situation, there will be a big brother somewhere who will say, yeah, I, I know what you're doing. I can see right through this game. You're just thinking you're going to be the big shot on the stage here. You, you think, really, you're the guy? David said, what have I now done? Verse 29, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? David was motivated differently. Eliab spoke as a man would, uh, from, from a physical man's perspective. He's like, I know what you're doing, David. You're a young man. Every young man wants to come down and see the battle. I know what you're doing. You're just down here. You abandoned those few sheep that you're supposed to be taking care of. And you're down here because you want a little drama and excitement. You came down here hoping to see something neat to go home and tell all your pals. I know why you're down here, David. David said, excuse me. What, what did I do? Is there not a cause? I wonder how much of God's glory is being held back because we are afraid of people thinking that we're spiritually proud. Spiritual pride is a grave danger. But if you decide to involve yourself in ministry, God will take care of the pride. There's something about running towards an oncoming giant that will deal with your pride. Or, there's something about kneeling down at that brook to pick up five smooth stones when you're looking at a, a telephone pole for a spear. Something about that will deal with your pride. I'm speaking seriously now. I, the, the Anabaptist people have a tremendous fear of pride. It is something unique to our people. I'll include myself. It's something unique to the Anabaptist people that we are terrified of being spiritually proud. Spiritual pride is something you should be concerned about. But don't let it stop you from standing up for the glory of God because that priority supersedes Amen. the others. And if you become active for God's glory, the elements of human pride that are in you will be melted away by the struggles and challenges you go through. And they, it happened in David's life. If there was a little bit of showmanship in David, it got chased out of him while he ran up and down through the wilderness, chased by the king that he had served. Okay? Don't let the thought of, maybe people will think I'm proud, make you not step up. You step up for the glory of God and ask God and trust God that he will help you with whatever pride might be motivating you. The story is told of a child who was in a Sunday school class and the teacher asked all the Sunday school students, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they got around the circle to this one little boy, and the one little boy said, I want to be a returned missionary when I grow up. I want to be a missionary on furlough. Probably that little boy had seen missionaries get up on the stage, and everybody clapped for them and brought them baskets of gifts and took up an offering for them. And he's like, yeah, when I grow up, I want to be a returned missionary. I've actually had a lot of people, an, an absolutely stunning number of people in my life say to me, I'm concerned that with all the praise and success you have that you could be caught up in pride. And I've said to those people, you know, you only see me when I'm here where people might 
respect me. I said, nobody's around me day after day after day after day while I'm trying to faithfully serve the Lord Jesus in Africa. I don't think I'm a big shot. I preach all the time. I preach multiple, multiple, multiple times a week. My average size audience is 15 people. I'm not a big shot. The little boy said, I want to be a returned missionary. Well, in between becoming, going from not being a missionary to being a returned missionary is an awful lot of humiliating experiences. Don't say, I'm not going to step up because people might think I'm proud. David said, is there not a cause? And I'd like to say to you young people today as we profile the kingdom courage of David, there is a cause. God's glory is downtrodden in our day in just as dramatic a fashion as it was when Goliath of Gath stood there and said, you can't even find me one man. Just give me one man. Do you got any men over there, Israel? Give me just one man. If, of course, you have any men over there. That is exactly how Satan mocks the church today. Maybe I feel too much, but there are times where I view what's going on in the Western world today, and I feel like I can hear Satan laughing at the church. I feel like I can hear him mocking the representatives of the kingdom of God here on this earth. I feel it. Yeah, give me a man. Do you have a man? Do you have a man over there? Men of Israel? Servants of Saul, do you guys have any men over there? Just looking for one man. Do you have a man over there? No, but we have a boy. Not a man among them, but we have a boy. David was motivated differently. His word back to his brother was not a defense of his actions or trying to, to tell his brother that he's reading it wrong. He just said, isn't there a cause? Yo, Eliab, you've been standing here day after day. You're obviously older and stronger and bigger and more experienced militarily, but you've been standing here day after day listening to those insults and running with the best of them. And now I'm standing here saying, who's going to take on that uncircumcised Philistine who keeps mouthing off about the armies of God? And you're saying, yeah, David, where'd you leave your sheep? He said, isn't there a cause? And God's kingdom in Canada is waiting for some young people who will stand up and say, there's a cause. There is absolutely a cause, and the cause is to defend the glory of God and make his name great. David was motivated differently. Verse 30, and he turned from him and turned toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul and he sent for him. People go into the king's palace like, there's this guy out here saying, you know, talking, let's use modern lingo, talking smack. There's a guy out here who's like, oh, I can take on the Philistine. Who's that Philistine? Who's this uncircumcised dog talking against the armies of the living God? David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him, except that all the men's heart had been failing because of him. We've been running for a month. David stands in front of the big King Saul. He says, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said to Saul, okay, let me explain how I view it. Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after him, and I smote him, and I delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and I smacked him one and I slew him. David not only was motivated differently, he believed differently. 
He says to King Saul, you're telling me I can't do this. Please, I, I, I know I look like a stripling. That's exactly how he was described in the King James English. Whose son the stripling is? I know I look like a stripling, but I've actually taken on lions and bears. And this is how it went down, King Saul. I went out there and told that lion, give me back that sheep. And I smacked him when I took the sheep out. And then he growled and lifted his paws up at me. And I grabbed him by his beard. Wow. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this is where his different belief system comes out. This uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. Because I really got this grab the beard and smack him on the face thing down, King Saul. No. No. This giant is going to be like one of, those arm, one of those animals because when a human being stands in the face of the almighty God and mocks him, that human being becomes an animal. When a human being stands in the face of his creator and defies him, that human being is just another animal. David believed differently. David understood what was going on was a kingdom face-off. It was not the Philistines against the servants of Saul. It was the armies of the living God versus everyone else. Seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Not a small difference in who you identify yourself as. Your identity is massive. You go out there day after day as the, the servants of Saul. You know, it's the King Saul's got to feed us out here because we're servants of King Saul fighting for King Saul. You go out there as the servants of King Saul. When the Goliath of Gath stands up, you're going to be running the other direction. David did not see himself or the others as the servants of Saul. He said, these are the armies of the living God. If you're just a servant of Saul, yeah, probably you should run when Goliath comes. But if you're a servant of the living God, know who you are. And that identity is powerful in your life. He said, he's defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. He believed differently. And Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass on his head, and he armed it with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he assayed to go. He got him all strapped down and loaded, and David said, okay, here I go. And then he couldn't go. For he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. Just watch this. And he took his staff in his hand, and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in the shepherd's bag which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistines. David was equipped differently. David was equipped differently. Not with all of the accoutrements of physical warfare. Well, at least if you're going to go out, you better wear the king's own armor. You better go out there with the best breastplate and the biggest sword. And you better go, if you're going to really take this on, we better equip you. Put all that stuff on David. And David says, I haven't proved these. This is not the way I'm used to fighting. I didn't have any of this stuff on when I took on the lion and the bear. And David takes it off of him. Picture Picture this hero, takes all this stuff off of him and he walks out of the tent of King Saul and he stops by the brook and he kneels down and he picks up five smooth stones and he puts them in, his, in that little bag, that same trusty bag that's been holding his stones. He is a shepherd, he looks like a shepherd, he's equipped like a shepherd. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, verse 41, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. Is there any New Testament verse that comes to your mind when you hear that word, he disdained him? How about God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the things that are mighty? 
So obviously, when Saul started across the valley, he couldn't really identify. It must have been a big valley. As Saul gets near him, he's like, hey, we finally got the man! And Saul gets near him, and he's like, oh, my goodness. He disdained him. They sent a child out here. For he was a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog? David said, thanks for asking. Yes. <laughs> yes. Takes one to know one. You are, sir. Am I a dog that you come to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. David was not afraid of being cursed by those gods. And the Philistine said to David, come here. Come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, he's still speaking differently, still believing differently, still equipped differently, still motivated differently. David says, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. You come to me with all of this physical armament, all of these weapons of war, but I'm coming to you in the name. We talked earlier about words, the spoken word of God being more powerful than the physical world. David says, I come to you in the name of the God of Israel, the God who you have been defying. Verse 46, and this day Will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee, and I will take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. It, 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 in some ways, it's just this like understated just explanation. I'm just explaining to you what's about to happen. Goliath, it, this is what's about to happen. I'm going to smite you, and then I'm going to take your head off. And this is, the, this is what is going to happen. This is how it's going to go. Points one through four. All of this is going to happen. Read the rest of the verse. That all the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Yesterday it was that that the king of Syria may know that there is a prophet in Israel. Now it's that the, that the whole earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Let me ask you, do you, think, do you think that story spread? Do you think that kind of news kind of travels? Yes. The known world got to hear this story right here. But look at David's motivation. He was motivated differently. He's just laying it out, points one through four. This is how this encounter is going to end. And this is why it's going to end this way. It's going to end this way because you defied the armies of the living God. And so now I'm going to have to take your head off. And I'm going to have to do this. And I'm going to have to do this. And the reason why I'm doing this and the reason why God is empowering me to do this is not so that David gets a name. It's rather that the whole world may know there's a God. You do not stand on God's green earth as a created, a person created in the image of God and defy the armies of God and get away with it. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. And so now this is what's going to happen, Goliath. This is going to happen, point one, point two, point three, point four. And the sum total of all it is is that the world is going to find out there is a God in Israel. We fight sometimes with the Philistines, and they've sometimes conquered us, and we sometimes conquer your people, but Goliath, you overstepped. You defied the armies of the living God, and now you're just an animal. Not only that, verse 47, all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. Talk about a man who understood God's glory and understood how that understanding of God's glory would impact the world and the church. He says, this is what's going to happen. It's going to happen so that the world will know there's a God in Israel, point number one. And then this assembly, what assembly? 
These Israelites who've been running day after day from Goliath, all these men with coats of mail and swords and spears and arrows, all these men who haven't been able to step up to the plate and take on Goliath of Gath, they're all about to get schooled. And they're about to get schooled on this fact. God doesn't save through swords and spears, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Oh, but the church could use some Davids. And please, young ladies, the Bible highlights a lot of men that in no way takes apart from the integral and immensely important role that women have. Okay? The world could use a few Davids, male or female. A few people, young people, who stand up and say, everybody's hearing this, but nobody seems to realize that this is a battle for the glory of God. Won't somebody step up? If nobody's going to step up, I'm going to step up. In the spirit of Timothy, be an example to the believers, Timothy. Don't let anybody say, yeah, you're just a young person. Oh, but the church needs some Davids. Oh, but the world needs some Davids who will step up to the plate and allow God to use them to showcase his glory on the earth so that all the world can know again there's a God. The world's seeming to lose, lose that consciousness real fast. We need some Davids who will step up and allow God to use them to demonstrate his glory so the world will know there's a God. But as much as the world needs that, the church also needs this demonstration of God's glory because we, just like the Israelite army, start thinking that it's about swords and spears. And we could also use a few lessons in the fact that the battle is the Lord's. David fought differently. Verse 48, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward. I don't think the Bible wastes words. The Israelite men had spent their days hasting and running away from. Now David hastes and runs toward. Hmm. Maybe I should have put a point in there. He runs differently. Instead of running away, he runs toward. My, but we need some people who will face the enemy in that spirit. He ran toward. And David put his hand into his bag and took thence a stone and he slang it. And he smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Scripture doesn't want us in any way to misunderstand what just occurred here. Don't want somebody to tell the story down the road and say, well, he had Saul's sword. There was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran, stood upon the Philistine, and took out his sword, and drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted, Oh God, give us some David's. That could make the church shout again. Amen. These are the same guys, you know. Same guys have been turning tails and running day after day, day after day. But they, they, can, they, can, they, can, they can accept and understand and see and believe what just occurred in front of their eyes. They can see that God's glory is being demonstrated. And they shouted and arose and they pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley to the gates of Ekron and the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Shareim even unto Gath and unto Ekron and the children of Israel returned from the chasing after the Philistines and they spoiled their tents and David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem but he put his armor in his tent and when David saw, when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the captain of his host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. The king said, Inquire 
thou whose son the stripling is. Now, I don't know if Saul was starting to have dementia. I don't understand how he could have had this young man playing harp. However, he was playing harp when he was not in a very good attitude or spirit or mental, mental state. But somehow he doesn't recognize who this young man is. What a fitting way to close out the story of God's glory in David's life. Hey, Abner, who, 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 who is that young man? Abner says, as thy soul liveth. I have no idea who that person is. But I expect I'm going to be finding out because I'm going to be informing the next of kin. You know, that falls to the captain when you lose somebody on the battlefield. I don't know who he is. Saul said, find out who he is. Find out who he is. David fought differently, and David celebrated differently. David fought differently, and David celebrated differently. He ran. He killed that Philistine, and then it says he ran and took his own sword. Now, I understand in the Western world, some of those words don't mean a lot, but when you tell that story in the Eastern world, which includes Africa and Asia, the fact that Goliath was killed with his own sword means like three times more to them than it means to us. His own sword, they always say, with his own sword. And those ironies mean something to the kingdom of God. He cut off Goliath's head with his own sword. The very sword which was meant to decapitate David was now used to decapitate Goliath with his own sword. David fought differently and he celebrated differently. Maybe you've noticed that all eight of these points, let me repeat them in case you like to write them down in the margin of your Bible. David heard differently. David saw differently. David spoke differently, he was motivated differently, he believed differently, he was equipped differently, he fought differently, and he celebrated differently. Maybe you notice the word different. It's in every single one of those points. This profile in kingdom courage, this young man sets an incredible example of living a different kind of a life. And I really believe David was on par with all of y'all. I don't think it would be highlighted in Scripture if David was my age. I think David was a very young man. And yet David, while being a young man, had had enough of experience with God in the wilderness with the sheep that he was able to walk into an encounter that tens of thousands of Israelite men saw only physically. And David walked in and saw it as a battle between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. He saw it as an opportunity to stand up for God's glory, and he did. I want you all to be different from this world. Be different. See things different. Hear things different. Respond differently. Be motivated differently. Fight differently. The church for you doth wait. The world waits to finally have another demonstration of the glory of God so that the world will know that there is still a God. And the church waits because the church could use a few more demonstrations of God's power and a little bit of, of reminder that it's really not about the size of spear and the size of sword and the height of the person. It is God's holy irony that he loves to use the things which the world disdains to take them on. Those things that are weak, those things that are, are, that are not to bring to naught those things that are. And that's the story of David and Goliath. It's an Old Testament story, but those New Testament verses absolutely apply. God does it for his glory. Do not look at your age. Do not look at your height. Do not look at the size of your spear or sword or Goliath's for that matter. Don't look at it. 
Seek to be a young person who sees the glory of God as paramount and makes yourself available for God to use you. That is our profile in kingdom courage from the life of David. Let's bow down our heads. Rise up, O youth of Christ. Have done with lesser things. Father, I pray that this challenge from the life of David would resonate in the hearts of these young people. Lord, that the life of this young man speak directly to the hearts of these young people. It's really not about age. Eliab and Saul heard the same things. Father, encourage the hearts of these young people that you can use them. Encourage them, Father, that they can walk into situations that other believers have looked at as lost causes. They can step in there and say, somebody needs to fight for God's glory right here. Oh, Father, I pray that you'd make them different. Make them unique. Make them uniquely yours. May all the world see that they've been with Jesus. May all the world see that they have their eyes set on a different kingdom. I pray that you'd use them, Lord. Use them to show the world that you still exist. And use them to teach us, the church, that it's not about sword and spear. Father, we thank you for recording this story. Make it real and pertinent to our adult lives through the sharing of this message today, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.